Good morning. This will be the non-technical part. What I'm going to try to do this morning, which I think this is what Daniel asked me to do a few months ago, is we're, of course, here to mostly talk about bioenergy, what's going on, what kind of opportunities are, are being created by the emergence of the bioenergy markets, especially with respect to hardwood industry. What I'm going to do is to talk about the sort of setting in term market setting in which this these markets are emerging. So I'm going to review some of the things that have been happening nationally in all wood markets and a little bit, especially with respect to hardwoods. Um, hardwoods are a little bit tough. When you deal with softwoods, uh, if you're doing dug fur on the west coast or loblolly pine in North Carolina and Georgia and South Carolina, the size of the trees and rotations are different, but the end products tend to be pretty much the same. So the same kind of things that what it's meant in terms of industry. These, this slide shows job loss nationally. Red is 10,000 or more jobs in a state. So this has been pretty significant in terms of what it's meant for forest industry. In North Carolina, you look at different metrics describing forest industry and number of facilities, employees, payroll, gross product value between 2002 in 2011, 
almost all of those are down by about a third. So that's what it's meant for us in North Carolina. Sawmill decline. Those are the numbers in North Carolina. You can follow the decline from, uh, and a lot of this, of course, started before the so-called Great Town Downturn. A lot of that was consolidation, some mills getting bigger and the smaller mills disappearing. But of course, here's the period where it's really continued. Veneer mills in red, pulp mills have been pretty static. They're in blue, composite panel mills, so that's fiberboard, OSB, things like that, the green line dropping. Same sort of trend. So what has it meant for stumpage price from a landowner perspective? Well, I picked a couple of dates from one of our price reporting services and kind of bound at either side of the economic downturn and all this assuming that we're out of it, which we're not. And here's what it's meant. So these are prices for some of our most common stumpage commodities in North Carolina in 2007, and these were the latest ones just reported. And if you look at pine pulpwood, we're actually doing better than we were back then. Now, uh, important thing to note, I didn't show this. If you looked at the last quarter from 2012, it doesn't look as good as it does now. The last quarter has really picked up a lot, so there's been a pretty significant change. But this is a pretty big one, pine chip and saw, the, the intermediate thinnings, the high value thinnings from pine plantations. Again, it's picked up in the last quarter, but it's down a good bit from where it was. Pine saw timber, that's the one that's taken the big hit in the southeast. And softwood nationally has taken a big hit. As I said, up through sometime in 2012, it was about 50% of the value. Hardwood pulpwood, a little bit of a decline. Hardwood saw timber, actually pretty static. So I've got a bunch of graphs that are too small to really see except to notice the trends. So these are 35 year for North Carolina stumpage prices. So what you're looking at between 76 and 2011 are different parts of the state, the green being the average. This is pine saw timber stumpage price for a 35 year history. And the scale sort of gets lost a little bit, but it, it actually is not insignificant. The difference between these values here and the peak, it's about a 300% gain they made before the drop that we started seeing in the 2000s, which now has picked back up a little bit. So that's what pine soft or softwood stumpage prices have looked like. Look at softwood pulp, not quite as noisy, but the scale, uh, not the scale, but the, the percent increases over the time overall have been about the same. That's picked back up, not shown on here. Hardwood saw timber stumpage prices, a lot flatter line, or a lot steadier increase. And it's been much, much less noise than softwood, at least for North Carolina. And hardwood pulpwood. So that's the sort of trends we're, we've been seeing. But we're here talking about renewable energy, bioenergy, the whole renewable thing and what it might mean for, for the hardwood industry especially. And so a lot of this is a repeat on things you heard yesterday, especially Helene's presentation. So as was pointed out, especially by Steve Kelly, but Helene made the same point, the stuff's being driven by policies. And how did Daniel, how did Steve put it? policies, he, just, he said something to the effect they can be given, they can be taken away. And these are examples that were, lar with ex one exception, that were largely talked about yesterday. Some of the national policies that are pushing renewable fuels. A lot of the states have adopted renewable portfolio standards. And how many, he said, Helene, 16 states are considering uh, reducing them or eliminating them, something like that, correct? 16 out of 26. So we talked about the big EU policy that's pushing the pellet market relative to biofuels. And I don't remember whether we talked about this one or not. 
but this is a major driver nationally. And I, my guess is, and we'll get Jim to comment maybe when we get into some questions, my guess is this will be one of the two main drivers nationally for biofuels, with the other one being climate change. A lot of the other stuff may be fickle. It may depend on whether Republicans are in Congress or the Democrats and who's in the General Assembly. But our U.S. military very much wants to aggressively pursue development of biofuels. For them, it's, it's a national security issue. And I was, I don't remember who I was talking to, like maybe last night at supper, but one of my big sets of projects is working with our U.S. military in North Carolina on sustainable land use issues, both on the bases and off the bases. And so I'm part of this Southwide work group called SURPASS. And we had a, Helene was there, a big meeting. And so we had people from EPA, the Forest Service, all the big agencies, and most of the installations across the southeast. And yeah, the day was devoted to bioenergy. So they had presentations on specific projects from the f uh, fuel for schools all the way to bases that had put in bio, uh, put, in, put in power plants and things like that. And there were a lot of examples of failures. A power plant that didn't use the right technology and the, you got bridging in the augers and they shut the whole thing down. And anyway, there was a lot of sort of, it wasn't designed to be a negative presentation on the potential for bioenergy for the military, but it, with all the examples of failures that were, were given, it sort of came across that way. But they ask a general with the U.S. Marine Corps, who's responsible for all the southeastern marine installations, to summarize what he thought he heard that day. And uh, General Gorey, still, still in that same position, said, well, I've heard a lot of stories about what doesn't work. We don't care. This is national security that we're talking about. We want to push ahead. So you're going to see that big be a big driver. The uh, U.S. Navy is very anxious to get biofuels into the Atlantic Fleet at our two bases in North Carolina. Uh, they want to displace half of their jet fuel for Harriers and Osprey and helicopters by 2020 with biofuels. So I'm sort of dwelling on this to say watch for this. This is going to be a big driver. So we've talked about some of this. This is sort of North Carolina as an example of responding to some of these things. So we've got, and Helene probably can give better numbers, but some privately owned power plants that are converting or have converted to biomass, some being planned or talked about, some are just across the line in Virginia, some combined heat and power conversions completed or underway, talked about wood pellets, and we mentioned a cellulosic uh, ethanol plant that's been announced for southeastern North Carolina, largely based on grasses, but also wood. We'll see whether it ever shows up on, as a, in concrete and steel. But things are happening, and they're happening because of policies, and they're creating markets. And so just a quick review on some of the major sources of wood feedstocks that are out there and where they're going. For electricity, we're mostly talking about using so-called dirty chips or hog fuel, whole tree chips produced from logging residues during conventional harvesting. And we won't go over this in detail, but basically loggers recover this stuff at the same time they're producing conventional roundwood pro products and mostly from logging residues, but in absence of markets for thinnings, they can chip up pulpwood and at least help a landowner continue to manage the stems on a, on a plantation. And a lot of that stuff that's normally left on the landscape gets removed as part of this kind of operation. And that's, of course, a deck pile. And the thing we have particularly talked a lot about yesterday was the rapid development of these large pellet companies in the south and southeast. And as Helene noted, mostly being done on logs that are being purchased, low-value logs, 
brought in being debarked and shipped and dried and pelletized, but they really, really like dry mill residues when, when they can get them. And so we mentioned yesterday the one example of one of our big poultry producers in eastern North Carolina now is having a hard time getting shavings because they're being outcompeted for by, the, by one of the pellet mills. And they were saying on a call we had two weeks ago, um, I think in the last quarter their delivered prices for shavings has gone from $50 to $70 a ton when they can get them. So that's a pretty big spike in prices based on one pellet mill that's actually open in North Carolina. So these are the kind of impacts and depends on who you are, as we said many times yesterday, as to whether this is a good thing or not. If you're the person who's producing the shavings, for that, uh, as campers go, you'd be among the happy. So uh, there, there are open up markets, and they do use some logging residues. And then, of course, the transportation fuel, where that's going to go. You heard Steve Kelly's presentation yesterday's a zillion technologies and combinations of technologies. And yes, Ed, I, I like this slide years ago, so I always have to figure a way to put it in. Uh, and of course, research is what I do. And it could be all kind of things. Uh, probably half the research I'm involved with now is I'm working on short rotation hardwood crops. So whether the markets will show up at a level that will support those or not, we'll see. This is an outdated slide by a consulting firm out of Atlanta. They've actually got a newer version of the same kind of slide. And Helene's got a slide similar that comes from another company. But a lot of forecasting as to where these bioenergy sectors are going to go over the next couple decade or so. And the interesting thing is sort of the noise or believability of this. In this particular release from this company, Forisk, and they, they screen all the announcements and rumors of these projects that are going to happen. Uh, and then they, they rate them how much of, they've got a 10 factor scoring system they use when someone says we're going to build a ethanol plant or we're going to build a pellet plant and they evaluate all those 10 metrics and decide whether or not they really believe the plant or not and when they take all of the announcements which is what you're looking at in color and at this time and they say what do we buy that's that line there so lots of these things never end up showing up on the landscape. Some other things impacting uh, our markets for all of our material and just some, some notes around the country. There are inventory factors, things that are changing. In the south, that's, we're the place where we're most losing forest land. It's being converted to other uses. Lots of industries moving to the south. People moving to the south. So that's one of the inventory factors. And there's a huge report that, that documents that. Projected expansion of hardwood timber inventory, on the other hand, is going to be concentrated in the north, somewhat in the south, but where hardwood inventory is more than doubled over the historical period. In the north, north, and, and Ed, I'm sure you can tell lots more detail, but as one of my understandings is, and from Forest Service reports, is our inventories are increasing in our hardwoods. A lot of the species that are standing on the stump are less desirable species from what and we see this in our southern Appalachians. That's where our national forests in North Carolina are concentrated. Mostly is in the mountains. And we've basically quit doing any kind of management. So we're seeing the same kind of things happen down there as well. Projected expansion in the softwood timber inventories concentrated in the west, where softwood inventory has been expanded historically since timber harvests have been scaled back on federal lands. U.S. Nas nationwide timber growing stock inventories are projected to increase. And those are some of the numbers. And that's sort of interesting. Uh, the U.S. Forest Service since the 19, mid-1920s mid have published paper after paper after paper on how we're going to be running out of wood in the United States. But that's actually what's expected. So what will all this mean in terms of 
market strategies when you try to somehow boil some of this together. Well, last April, James and I, who's gone back to the hotel, uh, published a national article on timber trends, and we asked five other people who were knowledgeable at different parts of the country to co-author this, and we asked them to look at the last 10 years, describe what has happened in terms of markets, and ask their forecast on some of the major things they saw coming up. So I extracted a few things a couple of days ago from that article, and so we'll just quickly look at a few of those. So these are updates. The Northeast, strong saw log export and finished import market with Canada. Mill closures have left larger, less diversified mills. More single product demand makes marketing diverse stands difficult. So you've got stands with opportunities for multiple products and yet the main markets locally, based on what the mills are producing, may only be one or two products. Loss of logging capacity. This, will, this is a theme nationally. A lot of folks went out of business during the downturn. Surviving mills will be in demand. Eventually, stronger markets ahead. South and southeast. Decline in construction grade southern yellow pine, OSB, fiberboard prices. Hardwood exports have increased, allowing less price reduction. For North Carolina, we were sort of the home historically of the furniture industry in western Piedmont and the mountains of North Carolina. So now what we do is, and it's starting to turn around the last couple of quarters, but what we've been doing in recent years is we harvest the same logs, we put them in containers, either as round wood or as rough sawn lumber. We send them to our Wilmington port and they go to China where the furniture is manufactured, it comes back in containers and gets upholstered and then the same traditional labels get put on the furniture. Some of that's beginning to turn around as labor prices are increasing in China, but it's kept our, our stumpage prices somewhat static. Logging capacity is a big deal in North Carolina. We recently talked with our largest paper mill in North Carolina who is always beginning to struggle getting pulpwood because of the pellet mill that's shown up not terribly far. So we sort of quiz them, is this a matter of them competing from the same resources? And what we've been told is it's more the loggers are servicing the pellet mill and that's reducing the logging capacity. So these are, these are real factors. Energy markets increasing. Housing will rebound. Upper Midwest, forest products output. Employment down 25%. Aspen prices bottom 2005, but have stabilized. There, the bio boom has not happened yet, except for a few large RPS-based projects. Great hope. This was what was expressed by that offer for regional biofuels. You look at Montana, Idaho, and that area, timber harvest on federal lands declined 70% between the 80s and 2011. Major industry declined from those reduced harvests and the economic downturn. Many more acres of prime timber available, and the school fuels for the school project, of course, has, been, uh, has had huge success, been publicized well. Future depends on consistent, reasonable levels of harvesting on federal lands plus energy. So they, that author keyed in on energy as being a hope or a piece of hope for that future there. West Coast, harvest declines on federal lands. Private lands have been unable to sustain large mills. Co-ops being tried with variable success. Western cedar, incense cedar, Port Oxford cedar, Pacific Northwest, Redwood, and North California remain reasonably strong due to demography, energy production mostly from industry lands, rather than private lands. Red alder will be popular for furniture. Duck fir will be dominant for private lands. So, wrap it up with a few comments. What will all this mean to a landowner? Stumpage for logging residues is always probably going to be pretty low. Maybe $2, $3 a ton, but a landowner can get site preparation accomplished. Low value trees for energy will probably pay about or maybe even below pulpwood prices. 
but it's going to give the landowners a tool set they can use to manage their land for higher value products. There are some cautions for energy wood for landowners. Value of log and residues is going to increase as this industry begins to play out. And it, you would think right now if you talk to loggers, they're going to say that it costs us as much to chip and haul the residues to an energy plant as the energy plant's willing to pay with stumpage being classically considered a residual product value-wise. There's nothing left over for the landowners. But that those delivered prices are going to go up. So presumably landowners should share in that take at some point. And one of the things we see all the time is pulpwood. When, when a logger has access to energy markets, uh, and got the big chipper on site, pulpwood gets chipped for energy wood. And depending on what kind of sale it is, contract, usually the logger pays the landowner for pulpwood, but they don't pay for fuel chips that come off the side. So the logging boss is out there on the cell phone and the driver says, we've met quota for the week, can't deliver any more pulpwood. The skidders are still bringing in pulpwood to the landing. The pulpwood gets chipped because the energy plant's still receiving. And so what the landowner could have gotten, you know, nine or ten dollars a ton for something like that for pulpwood he gets nothing for so um, conclusion manufacturing residues will increasingly be in demand for energy will bring higher prices but the mill needs to do some shopping to locate the best customers large-scale pellet plants uh, will strongly compete for hardwood pulpwood proverbial global factors will make trend predictions uncertain in many prices are going to be wobbly and all with those kind of factors. Paper future, the term pulp wood may not necessarily mean heading to the paper mill anymore uh, as regionally expanding energy markets increase demand for this product class. When James does his analysis for pellet mills, the furnace that he often refers to as pulp wood, the pulp wood size. Uh, where large-scale pellet plants exist, significant competition for pulpwood, including plantation thinning, is going to lead to higher pulpwood prices. It's done it in Georgia. In the long term, climate change may be the most important driver for wood energy. For landowners, main value will always be saw timber and high-quality products. Recovery may still be five to ten years in the making. Low-value markets, including energy, are going to improve opportunities for stand management. Always get professional advice. And I'll just leave this slide up and take any questions. But for landowners who are interested in sort of keeping up with the goings on, announcements, um, market trends, and these sort of things, these are some terrific news, online news sources that landowners can subscribe to. So, any questions? I didn't see anyone asleep, at least. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I just wanted to add, did Kelly mention, you know, he mentioned that they, that somebody had flown a commercial aircraft all on bio-based jet fuel. Is that only for airlines, British airlines? I think it was Virgin. Yeah. Uh, there's a heavy push out west. Boeing is in a consortium. They would love to do bio-based fuel. I think that's feeding that military market. Dennis is talking about, I don't know if Boeing is interested in it from the commercial market or the military transport market. We did get a large contract with the U.S. military finalized the generation of transport vehicles. Uh, they're very interested in the bio-based technology. And I think it's the military pushing Thank you, Jim. Other questions or comments? So, Daniel, I might I might put you on the spot on on, on video. But you know, part of the part of the discussion is um, some 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 manufacturers or you know the, the 
chicken guys were, were trying to buy, you know, shavings were not able to get it the price that they used to pay for it. So they are just affecting the business. And uh, pulp industry is being affected because of the pellet industry just competing for the same basket. If we have, you know, jet fuel and uh, we have the military actually put it in, that's, we're talking about big basket of uh, biomass being requested or used by the military. So. We'll, I'm guessing for a biomass guy, that's the good news. But what happened with the rest of the guys? Because probably the military one, if they go for with all of that, that's probably is going to take all the biomass that we have available, at least. So what is going to be the impact? I mean, what is your input in the impact in the pellet industry that is going to compete with the jet fuel? It's, it's, this is you know, low value, it's my opinion. Can pull everyone out here for what they think, but most of this stuff is at the low end of the food chain, value-wise. And we've got people here. You guys can all the wizard chemists and thermochem people in the room can tell me better than I can tell you. But most of the process models that I saw your department doing several years ago, and some of the ones I've read nationally. Zero in about thirty dollars, my memory if I'm correct, about thirty dollars a green ton delivered. And it's to say that at any expected fossil fuel prices for the near term or the next ten years, that if we have to pay more than about thirty dollars to get a green ton of cellulose to our biofuel plant, we can't make it go. It's gotta stay less than that. Okay? Well then, by definition, this stuff is all fairly low value. So what you're impacting is the composite paneling stuff, um, you know, fiberboard, OSB, and the paper industry. And uh, and it is going to impact me. Uh, and I wouldn't shock me to see some mills drop out of the picture. There's a lot of discussion out there as to what happens uh, uh, last year. Uh, one of the price reporting services, I won't name which one, who was supposedly are independent, who subscribed to them, but they're really closely allied with traditional forest industry. One of their speakers, who's a pretty good analyst, predicted that the paper companies are going to kick butt with the pellet industry. They're saying that uh, if they have to, the paper industry First of all, that the pellet industry is mostly going to stay focused near ports. It isn't going to be as big nationally as we might think. Secondly, they were saying the infrastructure folks, loggers and other suppliers of, of services to the paper industry, are more loyal to the paper industry than they are the pellet industry. And if push comes to shove, they'll stay with the paper industry. And then lastly, the paper companies are enjoying a pretty good margin right now. And if they have to, they can outcompete the pellet companies for stumpage. Now, one of the rumors that I've heard, and we'll just leave this as, comes from a pretty good source, but we'll just say it's a rumor right now, is that in Georgia, the state of Georgia is the one that is most aggressively, and this doesn't get to the biofuels, I'm just dealing with pellets right now, because that's here and now. But the pellet industry is large in Georgia, and the state of Georgia has aggressively recruited pellet industry down there. They've got a couple of monikers they've come up with. One is the Biomass Corridor, and another one is the Saudi Arabia. What was that? You've read it, I'm sure. And they, they have, I mean, if you're a pellet company, folks from Germany show up over there, they will court you. So. Now the paper price, or hopefully prices, are really going up. And I've heard that the paper companies uh, have gone to the largest landowners and said, tell you what, you can sell any more wood to the energy industry, we're cutting you off. You deal with us and us only. So there are tensions to be worked out. Do I think it's going to have an impact on traditional forest industry? Yes. Is it going to be a positive impact? Uh, no, not unless there are ways 
the, some of those large low value industries can can participate, such as what Steve was talking about yesterday, you know, the, the biorefinery. Certainly for sawmills and people that produce waste products, they've got better and better markets for that stuff, and that should help their margins. That's a long, very uncommitted answer. The infrastructure has slowed you down, but it doesn't have stopped. But biomass availability is going to stop it. Something else to think about are the energy crops. Um, if you look at the yield of logging residues at a final harvest and then annualize what that equivalent is on an annual basis, uh, it's about a ton per acre per year in a lot of our typical final harvest, which is equivalent of logging residues. Uh, I grow hybrid poplar in North Carolina and grow 10 tons per acre per year, I think. So the energy crops may be a partial solution, but then where are you going to put them? Are you going to displace native forest? Are you going to put them on food producing land? And so I'm an old guy, so I won't be around all that long, so you young people get to figure all of this out. Uh, all right. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate it.